Good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome to Kaizen Central. It's fantastic to see you here today. Um, very much appreciate uh, everybody who's uh, taken the time to come and join us. Uh, to anybody watching on YouTube, I'm so pleased you're able to do so. Um, I hope you find the conversation as stimulating as I believe it's going to be. Um, I'm very delighted to welcome Verity Davidge um, of Make UK. Verity is the director of policy um, at Make UK, of course, which is the uh, the, the, the the manufacturers' organisation. Um, Verity, good evening to you. Um, people can turn their um, videos on if they like. Oh, there you are. Good, good to see you all. Um, Verity, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. Um, I, I guarantee you that it will be um, uh, a, a genial and productive conversation because that's how we always are here on, uh, uh, on Kaizen Central. But I just wonder um, if we could perhaps, perhaps you could tell us what you, um, you know, basically what your job is. What is your, your main purpose? What does Director of Policy at Make UK do? Um, so thanks everyone for um, inviting me here today and, and it's really good to kind of speak to you and I hope after I do a bit of an intro into um, uh, what we're doing and what I'm doing to really hear from you all on what you want to see Make UK doing. So um, as Director of Policy, I head up um, at Make UK's uh, policy and campaigns team and through that uh, we look at all of the issues that matter to manufacturing, uh, you know, economic labour market, skills, innovation, technology. We take all of the issues that the manufacturing industry are telling us and we take that insight and we influence government as, and stakeholders to then make an impact through uh, policy wins, policy achievements, really making the business environment for manufacturers one in which they can uh, continue to, to grow and flourish. Um, and this year, our, our our logo, if, if you will, or our narrative has been very much uh, backing manufacturing to engineer our future. And it's been a really exciting, you know, it's been a challenging 18 or so months, but it's it's been a really exciting one because I think it's been the opportunity to really just showcase what our industry has to offer. And throughout the pandemic, we have demonstrated that we are a hugely resilient uh, um, industry and one of which that can kind of tackle those societal challenges. You know, it was it was manufacturers that came and uh, produced 12,000 ventilators and repurposed production to produce PPE. So while it's been a really challenging time, actually, manufacturing is really in, in the spotlight. Um, and what I've been trying to do with um, our team is just to kind of escalate that message up to government um, and amplify our messaging on, apologies, <laughs> uh, slight background noise. Um, while I'm not being a director of policy, I'm a mum of a two-year-old um, who is often actively trying to get at my door. Um, so it's really amplifying that message to make sure that everyone is, is talking about manufacturing and we are looking at which policy levers we can pull to really um, enable more of the fantastic work that the industry does. Our focus this year has been um, under kind of four core campaigns, and that's how, how you build a strong industrial base. So how do you put the manufacturing at the heart of our economy, of government thinking, particularly around the levelling up agenda? Uh, digital and green. So how do we encourage greater digital adoption and transition to net zero? Uh, start up to scale up. So how do we support those small businesses to really to, to grow and flourish? And how do we encourage greater investment into the UK to be seen as somewhere where you want to start a manufacturing business? And then finally, navigating our new partnership, which is when we already dropped the kind of B word or now the TCA word of, of, of Brexit. So how do we navigate that and turn that challenge in, into opportunity? And through my work um, and the work of uh, the policy and campaigns team is that we really feed in all of that insight. So we use our membership team to get all of that insight and intelligence, our research base, we survey our members, and we put together a really impactful argument to government to say, actually, these are the kind of policy levers you need to be using to support manufacturing and help them to build back better in the words of the government. 
so that's just a kind of a, a very short introduction but happy to go into a bit more detail on on the, the, the kind of work that we do um, but like I said I'm really interested in hearing the issues that your companies are facing and what you see as the priorities so that we are making sure we are being the voice of manufacturing um, across all sectors and I think importantly across companies of all sizes. Can I just clarify that, Verity? Thank you very much for that uh, um, presentation. And the noise is off, I thought was delightful. Um, am I correct in saying that um, where you sit in, in, in London, in Broadway House, like mm. headquarters of Big UK, you've got representatives all over the country who are feeding, they're in constant touch with your members. And it's your membership's views that are reflected to government. Is that correct? Yes, that's exact, absolutely what we do. Um, so we cover England and Wales and we have uh, strong um, organisations and uh, relationships with Scottish engineering and manufacturing in Northern Ireland. And we also still have a presence in Brussels. Um, and we split those regions into nine regions, um, each have membership teams, and they are really the colleagues that are speaking to manufacturers on a daily basis. And that insight that we get is so valuable. So each week when I'm meeting with the uh, Department for Business, the first question we go into is, what are the topical issues, the opportunities and challenges your members are facing this week? And I know I can just go out to that membership team who give me that on the, you know, on the spot knowledge, whether it's port delays. Uh, this week it was trade credit insurance. That seemed to be the common theme. So we take all that insight and we think, actually, this is building up into a bit of a picture, a bit of an issue, and we need to channel it to government. Um, and we also survey our members. I appreciate those who are members of Make UK probably think a bit of survey fatigue, but actually that evidence base is what drives real change. And we are six months in and we can already cite a range of policy wins that we've got, whether it's extending the job retention scheme, um, getting government to, cult, uh, to consult on R&D tax credits, uh, work on cyber security. You know, there were kind of a range of wins that we've already secured, but we can only do that by having that really strong um, engagement with ma the manufacturing community. So it's all about getting that insight so that we can influence. It must be really interesting being the, 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 the interface, if you like, between you know, the work that's going on on the ground in UK manufacturing and the very different um, environment of Westminster and Whitehall. Um, are, are, you a, are, you a, a, are you a more policy, more manufacturing? Where would you put yourself? Or are you right bang there in the middle? Um, I, my background is policy. I've actually been at Make UK or formerly EF for next year will be my 10 year anniversary. Um, and I came in as a policy advisor um, and I've been lucky enough to actually progress through Make UK and I've kind of watched the policy and wider teams transform and change and I've listened to members through my years and already building up a, well, these are the new issues and these are the long-standing issues. Um, I should note that I came in to do skills and I still can't let skills go. And manufacturers still talk to me about skills, which I always love having a discussion on, on skills. Um, but what I find is really beneficial for me is, and it's been hard to do it virtually, is actually going out to visit manufacturing companies. That is definitely the best part of at my job to see them in action, uh, see what companies are producing, see the kind of apprenticeship programs that they're, de they're delivering because there's nothing better than going back to government with real life examples that we can talk about to say, do you know what, they're doing amazing things here. You should go and see them yourself. I, I, I wonder if, if you, I mean, I, I think that there's quite a lot of cynicism about government and you probably are very well aware of that. Um, it's very interesting to hear about the policy wins you had, and that's really great. Are, are manufacturers um, wrong to be cynical about whether government listens to their needs or not? Because the general impression is that the government, if we look at the ending of the uh, Industrial Tra Strategy Council, which was, I think a bit of a blow, um, and, and, and there's just a feeling that government really doesn't care that much about manufacturing. Are we wrong? 
I think that the canning of the industrial strategy was a big hit for us all. Um, we were very active in that we wrote a public letter to the Secretary of State for Business sharing our frustrations and disappointment. Um, and on the back of that, he replied to say, look, we have this plan for growth. Um, it has these core pillars, skills, innovation, infrastructure, all of which manufacturing has a key role to play. And our ambitions are to transition to a net zero economy, to level up the UK um, and to create a global Britain. And again, you see manufacturing in all of those kind of streams. Um, that said, we still think there are things missing. So one of the, the kind of products or outputs that we are currently working on is an audit of the plan for growth so that we can look at it against the industrial strategy. So I think I think government is listening. And when I read the long document of plan for growth, appreciate it's not for everyone. I see, you know, manufacturing being talked about. And I think we definitely see it in just, you know, wider policymakers, the, you know, the Labour front bench. If you hear them, um, Keir Starmer, Rachel Reeves make a speech recently, manufacturing is constantly being kind of woven into that narrative. So Again, I think in the back, um, you know, against the pandemic, the role of the manufacturing industry has really come into play. And we have pro proven to be a more resilient um, industry and one that is ready to take on the societal challenges that, that we face in the future. Well, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm a stop blathering on because I'm, I'm not here to be a sort of, um, you know, focus of the of the, of the chat. I'd love other people to ask variety questions or as she invited us please uh, offer your own thoughts about what you think um you know policy ideas that should be pursued or or pursued differently should i say if you if you do know how to use it and i don't please use the raise your hand thing because it just makes it an awful lot easier for me uh to see who who wants to speak um so uh yeah I, I, the, you mentioned the, the trade credit um, reinsurance scheme ending at the end of this month, Verity. I did an interview with uh, somebody from the Confederation of British Metal Forming earlier today, and they're saying it's it, it, there's no chance it's going to be extended. It's a done deal. And an awful lot of manufacturers are going to find themselves in quite a bit of trouble if they're not strong enough um, to satisfy the insurers um, that uh, they qualify for credit insurance is that is that a reasonable assessment yes yeah, so we i actually had a meeting with the department for business um their officials who lead on trade credit insurance uh, this week because again it was just the constant theme that was filling up my inbox um from concerned uh, members and and our membership team um the, the, the decision has been made not to extend it um an extension would have to have the insurers also on board um, they see it as a stabilizing of the the market and if i'm if i'm allowed to, to quote the official back i, I hope i am <laughs> i'm now uh, live on youtube um they predict that just one percent of companies will be at risk of having no cover um, now i've got a couple of examples of companies who have emailed me to say that um, as of the end of june uh, their insurance is going to withdraw cover uh, and the department for business have been very um, kind of proactive and said look we will take these on a case-by-case -case basis and see if we can fix it because what we don't want to do is simply end the support and offer nothing in return um, I think it's also we are expecting a wider support of pack like a support package for business um, for the next four weeks, um, don't know quite exactly what that's going to look like, uh, but I think government have recognised that this there is still some concerns around the withdrawal of it, and they're looking to fix it. But the extension was seen as um, a bit of a, a bit of a no, should we say? <laughs> and also, the, see, at July first, it's the ending of the exemption um, for VAT on mm -hmm. trade with Europe. Am I correct? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so we've, we're almost heading towards a cliff edge. And again, that's what we, the narrative we always build in when we are speaking to government is that it's not just one single thing in isolation, it's everything 
uh, together. You know, we've seen the extension of the job retention scheme uh, until September, which is, you know, is, is good. It's something that we called for. But we also know that the tapering is going to start from July as well. So as an employer, we'll, you will need to be uh, contributing to um, that pot of money to fund employees to stay on furlough. Um, so we are you know, saying to government, actually, further support is needed. Um, we are considering whether now we need more of a sector approach to that support. Um, and I would really value anyone's input in that. Um, you probably have seen, and I think um, you might have done a piece with my colleague on our latest um, manufacturing outlook results. Um, and we hit all the headlines because it was the first time for ages that we'd actually produce more positive results. You know, employment intentions were looking up, investment intentions were looking up. But then, firstly, we were against a pretty low base of the first quarter, as you can imagine. And then when we do a bit of further analysis and we start breaking down into sectors, we still um, see struggles, for example, with automotive and aerospace. Um, and until travel pretty much opens up, we know the aerospace sector is still going to struggle quite significantly. So we're looking at now whether instead, instead of asking for just widespread support for everything, actually we need to look at more sector specific support. And one of the other key messages we've always been saying to government throughout the pandemic is just because manufacturing has been allowed to remain open uh, and operational, it doesn't mean that it has, isn't struggling. And we still see orders, sales, demand far below pre-pandemic levels. Um, and we see you know, food and drink equipment manufacturers who are feeding in directly into the, the hospitality sector. Um, so make sure that when you're offering you know, additional support measures in light of COVID, you factor in the various kind of component parts and being aware that our industry feeds into those that are still closed for business. Yeah, and you talk about a cliff edge and, and there's the, 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 the less visible added pressure of inflation, um, which is, is beginning to bite um, right across supply chains materials and so on. Um, listen, I'll stop talking. Phil Kernock, thank you for putting your hand up. Please uh, uh, go ahead and have a chat. Hi, Verity. Good evening. Um, just a quick question. It's around, you, you touched on it, really. You've just talked about sectors. I'm from the aerospace and defence sector. So I used to work at ADS. Um, not for the last four years. Um, so I ran the National Supply Chain Programme for ADS. I just wondered where the position is uh, between Make UK and the sector's uh, trade bodies, so more joined up kind of approach. Um, uh, is, it, is it joined up effectively enough? Is there more work to do on that front? Um, we definitely do join up. So we have um, a manufacturing alliance, um, so that's ourselves with ADS, SMMT, FDF, so kind of big trade associations that represent those sectors. Um, have you know monthly meetings with those to make sure that we are hearing their insight and they understand our kind of lobbying priorities. I think there is always more we can do. Um, we were discussing this week because um, we're producing a, a, a defence and aerospace uh, fat card and ADS have their own and we were looking at our data and looking at their data and we were thinking does it quite 100% match up I wonder why that is like we need to reach out to each other a bit more because if we want to showcase our sector we need to make sure even our data and our facts and figures are aligned um, but I'm very conscious that when we do make those more sector uh, you know calls for support that we do so with the backing of that respective trade association, so ADS or in you know or, or or SMMT through through automotive. Um, I think there's probably still more collaboration that we can do, um, but I like to think that we are definitely uh, well engaged, and nothing that we say or they say would ever come to a surprise. Um, the greatest value that we can do is if we all come together and can and can can agree common messages because I imagine as a government uh, official or a policymaker, the worst thing that can happen is to say oh well hold on because these guys came to me the other week and were painting a completely different picture and there's probably been historical moments where that has happened um, and I'm definitely keen to make sure we 
that doesn't happen that we are regularly um, engaging with them. Yeah, thanks. That's that's one of the points, really. We, we've we seen that kind of sector specific. Uh, obviously, aerospace has been in significant problems, as you said. And, and I think uh, ADS has been over the last year, has been very vocal on that. Um, but it's, it's it, a good example there was the lag, because you just said you picked up on that now and realised there needs to be sector specific stuff. But that was that was over a year ago that ADS started saying that, that that's going to come and it's going to hit us. Um, so yeah, more joined up would be greatly appreciated, I think. And I think I think generally manufacturing would like to see that across the SME community and the members of all those trade bodies, regional trade bodies as well, should see more joined up together between all the all the trade associations. Because we have we all have members that have, you know, significant percentage of their businesses in, in th- two or three sectors. They don't all sit in one yeah. sector alone. So, so you know, it, you know, to, to mirror that would be a lot more effective, I think. Definitely. And I know whenever I'm in a, a meeting with whether it's ADS, SMMT, FDF, um, I get so much in, additional insight because we obviously have members in, in those respective sectors. But they have that really technical and nuanced knowledge. And that's really powerful. Um, so, for example, we were speaking to the Secretary of State for Education on their lifetime skills guarantee. Now, um, if you just quickly look on the surface, it looks great for manufacturing in that they, you know, if you don't have an A-level or equivalent qual- qualification, uh, you can undertake this course um, you know, for free. And if you quickly glance down the list, you see lots of man- the words manufacturing engineering, manufacturing engineering. You think, oh, great, government is listening. Um, and then I was speaking to a colleague from the Food and Drink Federation and said, yes, but look, there's no mention of food and drink manufacturing. Back to that whole point that government doesn't understand all of the cornerstones of manufacturing. And so whenever we now talk about the lifetime skills guarantee, we say it's great that there's lots of manufacturing engineering courses. But can you see how you are missing these examples? But it was only through having that, you know, to be honest, it was them that flagged it to me and said, look down the list, like, look what is missing. Um, and we were able to take that meeting, that knowledge and briefing to the Secretary of State meeting. So I think that just shows the kind of the powerful impact that you have by having that additional insight. So I think definitely uh, one key action for me was would be to make sure that I am having those more detailed conversations so that we know exactly those more nuanced and particular issues that we should then be feeding up when we're talking about manufacturing as a whole. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and Verity, do you, I mean, obviously you're, you're, you're not the only game in town. There are the trade associations, as you've mentioned, and uh, professional associations. Looking at it from a sort of slightly detached point of view, um, what I find, and I've heard this echoed, is that there are so many voices out there that the the message can get fractured and diluted. Um, and not because nobody's trying, um, it's just that government eventually just sort of says, why are all these people talking to us? Why don't we hear any kind of unified voice? Is is that is that an unfair assessment of the situation? Um, I think in the last couple of years it's probably improved uh, slightly. There will always be organisations that go off and do their own thing. Um, we always try to align, like even with the the, the B five, as I think the government termed us of uh, Make UK, FSB, IOD, CBI and Chambers of Commerce. So when they are the we have the weekly Secretary of State meetings, it's with the B5 there's often then a B5 plus a 13 and then various others and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger um but what we try to do then and again from you know from make you see policy and, and campaigns team is always link up with our respective other in that organization and try to say look it's going to be really hard all agreeing three top priorities on how we want to reform the apprenticeship levy but between us we should be able to because if we just go to government and say, oh, here's the 100 things we would like changed, they're not going to listen. If we say 
we as however many organizations representing however many businesses and however many millions of people that we employ think you should be changing a b and c in that order that is very you know difficult message to ignore and one of the other things that we've definitely been doing a very actively been doing particularly on the skills front is also aligning to the tuc um, and bringing together the employee voice because actually what we say around skills and training and education and from manufacturing is very much aligned to a lot of the TUC's campaigns. Um, in fact, we have come together to establish um, a National Manufacturing Skills Task Force, which is co-chaired by uh, Judith Hackett, um, the chair of Make UK, and Kevin Rowan, um, who heads up uh, policy and campaigns at the TUC. We have all of those trade associations, ADS, SMNT, uh, CPA, everyone um, on board. We have the sector skills councils for our industry. And we've just started becoming, coming together to say, what are the key messages that we collectively want to put to government? And also, as a really kind of strong body of organisations, what are we going to do ourselves on skills? You know, what, where are the kind of gaps that we have between us and who else can do what? Let, let, let's start sharing the load. And we've just begun to identify some key projects that we're going to be working on, develop working groups and actually being really more proactive to think you've got some really great organizations but when it comes to that messaging to government actually then having that employee voice is also I think you know a really useful tool because we say this is for everyone now this is not employers you know saying that they can't afford train you know it's not barriers challenges etc it's opportunities um, and again I think that's what's been getting us some really good traction on, on the skills agenda in particular. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know about that, uh, that task force. That's, that sounds positive. Also positive to hear the TUC's involvement. I think that the, uh, the there, there's, I, I don't know what it is. I, I, maybe either it's historical or what, and maybe please somebody may speak to this. Why trades unions don't get more involved or aren't more involved in some of the strategic conversations around manufacturing, because um, the, the, <clears throat> the ones that work really well uh, do a fantastic job on the ground. And uh, I don't hear their, their views being taken much into account. Uh, does anybody have any information about that or any views on that? No. <laughs> oh yes, sorry, Stephen. Stephen, please. I mean, I, I, it's a socio-historical thing and, and obviously to a large degree driven by politics, but I mean, you're obviously comparing to what happens in Germany where there's always been this very different social relationship. Um, we see this in the sort of the Mittelstand, for instance, um, this, this close cooperation between workers who sort of see investment in the sort of future as being a vital part of their continued prosperity. I, I think it's the sort of the... the, the the Western way of doing things, um, most particularly sort of the, 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 the American way, which is the sort of the them and us. And, and, and I know that that kind of boils it down to, to a simplistic sort of um, overview. But but yeah, I mean, and, and there have been various moves towards developing a, a different sort of relationship. And I'd be very interested to know what Verity thinks of this, um, uh, certainly under sort of the, the new Labour government. But it all came to, to naught, as it were. I, you know, I, I, I do accept the sort of the, the, some of the unions have um, um, they've not been particularly helpful in breaking this this um, uh, this particular log jam or this 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 fixed view. Um, and it's only if, if we could ever get towards that, then we might uh, develop some of the sort of the the wider policies which would support manufacturing. Um, but again, yeah, there's a whole history that goes back, I suppose, to the the bad old days of the sort of the the 1970s. Um, uh, but yeah, it, I'm sure that there are, there are theses written on this. Uh, but, but anyway, that, that that's my view for, for what it's worth. Yeah, I mean, I I, I have to say that the it, it it did feel as if there was a a concerted effort uh, ideologically uh, to neuter uh, the unions at a political level. Um, but along with that went their voice, their very productive voice 
uh, on the shop floor. Um, and as you say, they, they do such a great job in Germany and in other countries uh, in, in, in harness with companies. And they've done really well over here. I have to say, there, I've done some great stories about uh, companies that have, have managed very, very well um, through productive and strong relations with the trade unions. Um, Verity, I don't know if you if you got any thoughts on what Stephen was saying about you know the emergence of trade unions or the re-emergence or um, into the conversation. Yes. Yeah, so when we look at our even our data, um, it's interesting. Uh, you know, again, pre-pandemic uh, compared to say ten years ago, the number of companies that have a recognised union, you know, was below I want to say you know 30 percent and even then it tended to be the larger companies uh, versus you know 10 years of data ago when it was always above 50 percent um, if, if not more um, I think we've probably seen a slight resurgence um, since the pandemic um, I know definitely where the TUC for example and others have been very uh, vocal on like the fire and re fire and rehire tactic um, where obviously companies we know have made redundancies and some have said, let them go, change the terms and conditions, um, bring that back. And I do think that maybe we might see a little bit of more resurgence um, where employees now have uh, you know, worked differently as well. Still, large numbers are working remotely. Yes, those particularly on, in production have, have continued to work. Um, but almost the workplace is changing. And I think whenever the workplace changes employees naturally then start to think okay how can we maintain this change or I quite like my life a little bit differently now like that, that and I think we'll probably see more um, engagement with the unions again um, but I think for us the priority is making sure we uh, really retain those positive relationships um, with not just TUC but for us you know Unite, GMB, those that are really um, involved within our the manufacturing industry to always just find those positive way forwards. Um, I think again we've seen this a lot through uh, we've been doing work with HSE um, and there's been a lot of um, kind of uh, the HSE under resourced of course due to COVID um, recruited a new uh, cohort of inspectors and they subcontracted it out and who they subcontracted out and um, some of them were previously debt collectors um, we've been feed, feeding all of this into uh, DWP and the HSE because not all members experiences were great ones and the TUC have really kind of pushed HSE to say there haven't been enough penalty notices um, to employers and so it was actually just coming together and saying okay what do we want all want to achieve actually just a safe workplace for employers and their employees you know we're on it's not about how many penalties we can di like dish out it's about how do we support employers in this really challenging time to make sure they are compliant with ever-changing rules ever-changing risk assessments and make sure that we're really just you know no employer wants to have their employee feel unsafe at all like we should take it as a real positive that we haven't seen you know large numbers of penalty notices issued we should think this is probably a really positive conversation that employers have had with their employees okay I mean, yes yeah, steve okay just quick just quickly just from my my, my small amounts of i have experience i've had uh, dealing with trade unions uh, i was in a position where i interacted with with the trade unions informally in other words i wasn't part of any formal negotiations. I was driving a continuous improvement program. And um, one of the points I brought up with the guys was, you know, why, why haven't you been out on strike, you know, fighting for resizing the Kanbans and that sort of thing? You know, the continuous improvement training is behind times. And, you know, so in other words, my point is, is that the, the unions could have done an awful lot more quite simply by putting themselves in a strong position to, to fight for the same sort of level and quality of training that, that, that trade unionists receive in, in other countries. Um, and um, quite, a, quite a few people who were the trade, who were strong trade unionists picked up on the, the, the continuous improvement activities, went for the extra training, 
and, and actually realize that the, 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 the training and, and, and continually improving the customer satisfaction was not at variance with legitimate union activity. It was a good way of protecting their jobs. Um, so I, I sort of, um, I sort of think there's 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 a lot that the the unions just um, and, and generally I'm a supporter of unions. I think they have a, a very active role to play, but I still think that, that there's an awful lot they could do by by fighting for for this, and 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 that puts them in a position where. Uh, I think they, they start to take what I'd call the high moral ground. Um, the, the, the Japanese, when they when they had so much trouble, they only implemented simplistically that they only implemented the job for life as a way to get the the totally totally wild trade unions um, uh, to to accept the continuous improvement activity. So there's there's you know there's it's not it's not at variance. Um, and, it, and if they took it on board, they'd be in a position to negotiate and say, you know, we will we'll do all this, but no members will be sacked. I think I think there's there's real there's real opportunities from the trade unions there, and and, and I don't see it coming either from a personal level, or a, you know from trade unionists I know, or from a very high strategic level from the uh, you know the, the the top men within trade unions. But hey ho. Well, I think. Yeah, I, I, I've written down. I think we should get somebody um, in from the TUC or from yeah, one of the big unions. Not? It'd be great to have them on, uh, on on the call. Let's get back to Make UK. I'm going to put people on the spot now. Lee, Lee, I wonder what 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 would you at CNC like um, to say to Verity in terms of policy that would make policy changes that Make UK could. Um, champion that would make your life better in at what you do at MCNC? Stop concentrating on A-levels, get back to more vocational skills. Um, not everybody is an academic, myself included. I would like to see more um, technical skills within schools in options and um, so when a child becomes 13 currently or 14, I can't remember now, year nine, I think they get to choose what they want to do. But there aren't many schools um, in, especially in less affluent areas um, that have craft shops, whether it's a metal shop or woodworking shop, um, textiles. Um, I was not very good academically, but I was very good with my hands because I couldn't see or what was being taught in terms of science and maths and how that could be applied in the real life world. So in my mind's eye, it was irrelevant. And it only when I became an apprentice, um, after being interested in the metalwork in the woodworking shops, that I started to use advanced mathematics and began to understand trigonometries and Pythagoras theorems and the coefficient of linear expansion because I could apply it and I could see it, touch it. Um, so I would like to see and push to go back to STEM-based activities. And as Steve Murphy said, reading, writing, arithmetic. Um, and we need skilled people, plumbers, carpenters, coopers, millers, turners, craftsmen, designers, artists, um, good vocational skills that are practical. Now that we're out of Brexit and um, everybody's talking about supply chain and Verity, it is great that you acknowledge the, the complexity of the supply chain within the many diverse and wonderful manufacturing sectors that we have in this country. And what the public do not know anymore is what we make. We produce everything from submarines to shoes, from... Oh, I could go on forever. Why do you think all the F1 teams are in this country? Because we're the best manufacturers, the best designers, the best engineers, and we have the, the most practically minded people. However, the, the, the innovators, the creators, and the designers, the really quirky people, uh, the real serious engineers and designers, they, are, they all get snapped up by the likes of your, your SpaceX and your Elon Musk's and your, your Jeff Bezos developing software and this, that, and the other. So we, we need to make the public aware of how strong our supply chain actually is and more importantly how much stronger it could be but unless we start bringing on 
and inspiring young people from, well, let's bring it into primary schools, give them bloody Lego to play with and build things with and apply the mathematics to it and talk about volume and geometry. Um, and it, it just needs to start a lot sooner. So those, we do something now, it's going to take three years to come into place. So a six-year-old now in three, four years' time, maybe 10 years old, entering secondary school. Now, if he can see a, a craft workshop or a textiles or um, a design shop, an artist shop, apply the mathematics, the mathematics, apply the science lessons based around certain vocational subjects that they can do and get them to build things. It, get, get back into the real bloody world and stop focusing on the service sector and having a Ponzi Nancy degree. That means absolutely nothing. Some poor sod is thousands of pounds in debt and he can only find a 20,000 pound a year salary. And it is ridiculous. So get back to basics. I would like to see education simply because we really struggle to recruit good apprentices and young people, not necessarily apprentices, just skilled people in general now, but because the lack of it, we're, we do engage with the colleges and we have an apprenticeship program and we try and seek and secure the best talent that we can. The ones that do see things differently can visualize a two-dimensional drawing into a, a three-dimensional image in their mind's eye and how we go about making things. So, yeah, start at the beginning and then we can recruit and then in 10 years' time we'll have a skilled workforce again. I think you're uh, well, speaking I, to Verity, that's great. she loves that. I, yeah, definitely. I mean, the best thing I've ever done in life is marry a carpenter. Um, do you know how much money I save at having built-in wardrobes done for me? Um, and it's interesting because, you know, he always says, so, oh, Leo, when you grow up, you're going to be like mummy. And I'm like, absolutely not. It's taken me like 12 years to pay off like a student a student loan. And when we were trying, you know, we're trying to get our mortgage, it's not, it's, it's my debt credit cards everything taken out during the university years that they're looking at you know i married someone who, who did an apprenticeship who you know never took out a credit card going into like the red is just not a done thing you're just earning and earning and and and, and being trained so on a personal level definitely agree and you know and obviously on a you know professional level of make uk that is very much our bread and butter and because I've always done education and skills it's always the campaign that just gets a little bit more um a little bit more push push and resource but also because it's just so so important um again I think we have opportunities I think what's great about Make UK is as well as being you know the voice of manufacturing delivering services to our members we have two apprenticeship training centers and again I just think that's a really kind of great thing to do as a business organization to say to government there are like, challenges within the skills and training but we are also trying to do our bit that on any kind of given normal year if you will um, we'd be recruiting 400 engineering apprentices um, and our numbers dropped this year to about 90 so a huge drop driven by the pandemic and unfortunately it was on the employer side because they couldn't place you know, new apprentices in their business, many were making redundancies, uh, hard to recruit, difficult decisions. Um, and yet we had this whole cohort of young people that really wanted those opportunities. So we were trying to work with other colleges and training centres to place them. Um, and then the other thing we did was we became a kickstart um, gateway. Uh, because we thought actually employers might not be ready to take on an apprentice and commit for those four years but they'll potentially take on someone for six months because the government then funds the wages ni and pensions and at the end of that they might be ready and i think last time i, I, I checked um, we had i think placed 500 kickstart young people within the manufacturing industry um so i think that's you know a real positive and i hope that some of them then convert to apprenticeships fully take your point on um, schools, exam, factories, um, whatever we want to call them, um, changing the grade system, one to nine, nine to one, A star to double A star, triple A star. It always even makes you know, me feel, I test someone's age by asking them you know, what they did when they were 15, O levels, GCSEs, etc. cetera, um, that we need to really push all of our influencing power into that. And again, I think there is, um, a little bit of an open door 
So when we were meeting ahead of the budget with the Chancellor and their special advisor, and we were talking about my other mastermind subject, the apprenticeship levy, um, the the bit that he kind of drew towards was more support for kind of STEM provision in schools and colleges, actually giving that capital expenditure, because he could see that it is so much easier for you know a college or even a school that has it to do the cheaper easier stuff it's a bigger investment to make sure you have all of that fantastic equipment that now our manufacturers are investing in that you want to then reflect in the real world so we are really pushing that at the moment and again on the school engagement part you know we've we've produced with the careers and enterprise company a very simple guide of how to engage with schools um I think we need to look at it again because we've seen lots of companies have to pull back all that activity. We're seeing fewer work experience, internships, et cetera, in light of COVID, and you risk a lost generation. So I think we need to work really closely with Make UK members in the wider industry to say, okay, how can we get all of these great schemes back on track? Because if we don't start doing something now and working more closely with the schools in four years' time, we're going to have an even bigger skills gap that we know we have now. So completely agree, and I'm sure nobody. Oh, um, you, you've uh, you've got you've got my mo- uh, vote uh, for sure. The verity, um, as people that know me uh, quite quite know my points of view, and uh, I've taken my company backdrop uh, off quite frankly because my views are, although um, in common, they're not necessarily those of the organisation that I I work for. <laughs> But um, to that extent, we, we genuinely do struggle with lack of engagement that um, we have planned what we're calling a festival of British engineering and manufacturing. And yeah. um, we've got lots of global representative uh, willing to get on board. So we're going to make it a live event. We've got the Aerial Motor Company with the Aerial Atoms going to be there. We're going to have jet-powered surfboards, aerial backpacks, flying cars. So young students can see, get inspired by fantastic, innovative British made products. Then we can come in and see that our partners, suppliers and customers, so they can talk to artists, designers, media out, um, media professionals. They can talk to software developers. They can talk to cutting tool manufacturers. They can, so they can see. So what we had planned was we were going to scan their hands as they come in with a digital laser scanner, they can see that element. We can then take the model into code. We can then take the code into the machine. We can then, by the time you finish your tour, you can go to the machine in question, open the door, and there we would have made your hand. So the latest digital technology is going to be used, and we it's it's, it's, all, it's all about making them realize that it's no longer dark, dirty, and the, the term engineering is too diluted and too many people call themselves engineers when they're not. But, yeah, well done, spot on. Thank you very much and um, keep keep up the hard work, keep shouting and um, shout harder and shout louder. Okay, uh, we've got two hands I need to get to. Ram. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, firstly, when I look at the 15 attendees here, I cannot see anybody who's representing a PLC, right, in, in a forum like this. And when you go to any event, which is an engineering or a manufacturing event, probably 60 to 80% of the attendees are from SMEs. When that is the case, why do organizations, including the Chambers of Commerce and the Make UKs and central and regional governments, only talk about UK PLC must do this? UK PLC must do this. Stop just talking about UK PLC. Talk about UK Private Limited, which is basically the bread earner for this country. If you look at the manufacturing sector, it's all SMEs, the private limited companies that are doing all the hard work. They bring in all the revenue and they need all the skills. Secondly, when we go to these events, right, like the manufacturing events and uh, whatever it is, when somebody is getting an opportunity to speak because they have paid to be you know, paid to be on stage, that is a bit of an insult to all the other attendees because what the person is going to say is going to be picking up their own company without adding any value to the attendees. That culture has to stop. People who want to speak, people who have to take the stage must be assessed on whether or not what they're talking about is presenting genuine value to those attending. And if SMEs, I mean, Lee is doing a fantastic job at MCNC. Richard Hagen, I mean, he's 
like the sustainability god as far as everyone is concerned and where is barry barry has, has prepared what six years preparing for brexit eventualities these are the kind of people who need to be out there talking about what they are doing and showcasing what smes can do why is that not happening anymore and the final thing is what i really love about kaizen central is no matter who you are no matter what size your business is you get an opportunity to voice your concern or voice your opinion simply by raising your hand why don't we see that everywhere else i don't understand that thank you well verity yeah. if you if you want to come back on that please we've got another question to get in so uh, i invite you to uh, just keep, keep it shortish Yes, of course. Um, I think definitely have to showcase um, our SMEs and agree Richard is a sustainability uh, god, as you uh, termed it. He's on our policy committee and various anything green net zero. Um, I just remember listening to Richard when I first spoke to him telling me he'd gone vegan. Uh, was it flying in any aviation or aeroplanes and uh, reducing his carbon footprint? And I thought I must stay, change my diesel car and move to an electric vehicle um, um, immediately. Um, I completely agree we need to showcase SMEs more. We are always looking for more companies to add to our media case study list because actually we get a lot of requests, whether it's from you know, journalists to go and uh, visits from ministers and MPs. Um, and what we want to do is we want to show them manufacturing, which is majority small businesses. Um, so um, and it's definitely a takeaway that if Make UK are doing panels, events, etc., make sure that we are showcasing um, those companies that we know are the real kind of creators and, and innovators. Um, we'll definitely take that away and um, make sure that there is never an all big business um, panel. I think we're definitely conscious of that, that it needs to be peer to peer and you need to be able to relate to that business just because they're in uh, manufacturing. It doesn't mean it's uh, directly relatable to you. So um, completely agree and well challenged, I think. Thanks, Verity. Graham, good evening to you. Nice to see you. Yeah, good evening, uh, Verity. I'm interested in what Make UK's attitude is towards T levels. You know, I personally believe these are a massive mistake. I think it's a political gesture to, uh, we've been talking about the skills shortage and that, and they, they've just gestured by changing the name and calling it T for technical. Um, I don't think the practical and they can work. Employers will not regard them the same as three A levels, and they've not a hope of getting forty-five days work experience for these young kids. I know I'm involved with some schools. How hard it is to get one or two weeks work experience. So if they think every student who's going to take a T level is going to get forty-five days, it's just not going to happen. So what's making UK's uh, thoughts on T levels. Yes, so for manufacturing engineering, I think T levels are rolled out now next September. Um, and I think we've probably already lost a bit of momentum from those who were backing it originally as a potential um, uh, route um, because so many other things have uh, taken the forefront of their minds. I think the initial feedback we got from so many businesses, which I imagine is what um, you're also telling me is, why T levels when for our sector industry, uh, VTECs and equivalent or work for us. Um, I think that the principle of trying to put vocational and technical education on the same esteem as you know, A levels is the right one. I think the challenge is it's just really hard to understand like the pathways that you can kind of move into manufacturing and engineering. And one of my pet peeves is we talk like academic education, you can go this way, or you can do like technical and vocational education go this way when actually they should be really interlinked and things like degree apprenticeships were a great example of that. Um, I think that the, with T-levels we're going to struggle to get employers buy-in for the exact same reasons that you have said. I think the placement will be a challenge. Um, we were quite successful in lobbying government to allow T-level students to spend uh, part of their placement in different parts of the business, in different businesses as well, rather than than one employer. Um, but I'm nervous about whether they will they will succeed. And with all this, all these things, you need that long term political buy in. Um, if a new government, new Secretary of State comes in, there's the tendency with education and particularly vocational education to change it. Um, so I think what our you know strategy at the moment is is to make sure we're speaking to the Department for Education. And if 
you know, two levels are being rolled out and I don't think they're going to stop, but I think it's one where we're going to have to make sure that they evolve. Um, what I wouldn't want to do is put out a message to say this new technical route is is rubbish because we're trying to really encourage vocational education. Um, but yeah, really keen to hear, I guess, if that's the kind of common view um, across the room on two levels that you don't think that they're workable. Again, stuff that we can feed back and suggest, I guess, an alternative. I've just got a <clears throat> final thought, Verity, because we, we do like to... Uh, Get away by seven o'clock, it's the witching hour. It's, uh, it's when Lee heads for his Malbec, as do I. And I know that you've got duties at seven o'clock as well. I'm just thinking, I forget the actual Kennedy quote. I was desperately Googling it. But it, it was, was it Bobby Kennedy who said something like, some people see things um, as, as, as they are um, and, and say why or why not. I forget what it is, but the point is, are we not constrained by existing thinking who out there is talking about bigger ideas i mean everything seems to be constrained by government ideology and policy and that's what we work within what about the bigger ideas who's canvassing for those and who's promoting those because it's the big ideas that will change the way we do things we seem to react to what's going on in the rest of the world and we react to the politicians who sit in Westminster but what, you know, how can we and who's going to do it formulate the big ideas that's actually going to make a quantum leap forward for our sector and for our economy. And I, mean, I think there is the roles for Make UK and the, the wider trade associations and all of the, the players including yourself that sit within that. Um, when we formulate our our core campaigns, and we call them our, you know, there are proactive campaigns, they're that digital and green campaign. Uh, there is all of the reactive stuff that comes underneath that we do on a day to day basis. But I just, I think it, it involves us coming, you know, cliche as it sounds, coming together and uh, with all of those trade associations and wider stakeholders and say, actually, government wants to build back better, but, you know, what do we want to do as? what do we want to do as, as an industry? What are our ambitions? And one of our kind of outputs following that audit of the plan for growth is, is it now that we say we want a new industrial strategy and this is exactly what it looks like. So we're doing a lot of consultation with our members to make sure that we aren't just doing that. Oh, we don't like that government. That's not going to work for that. You should be doing this. But saying this is where we're going to be. This is how we want we need to get there. And this is what government needs to do to help us get there rather than just be this kind of critical friend or whatever it is we want to term ourselves, however we want to position ourselves with government. And that really relies on us hearing di directly from you guys and making sure that we are feeding that in and we are providing that overall strategy that we aren't just reacting against government, but we are setting the agenda ourselves. Oh, it's good to hear. Beverly, I saw you put your hand up. We've got a couple of minutes if you'd just like yeah, to hop yeah, very, in. Uh, very briefly, and thanks so much, everybody, for the input and uh, Verity for your contribution. Um, I'm Beverly Nielsen. I actually work for a university, uh, but I appreciate the comments that have been made about degrees this evening. Um, <laughs> perhaps not all of the language, um, but uh, I, I was um, really interested, Verity, in uh, you know how you see... Uh, how, what, what Make UK is doing in terms of sort of assisting onshoring um, with the circular economy and moves towards a circular economy. Is this something you're involved with and perhaps just a few minutes on perhaps what, what you're doing? Thank you. Uh, yes, of course. So um, we often talk about onshoring, reshoring, and the big question is, are manufacturers bringing production uh, back to the UK? It's always a, a favoured topic. Um, uh, we're beginning to see some of that activity happen. And I think, again, in the backdrop of the, um, the, the pandemic in particular, where we've seen supply chain vulnerabilities that a lot of companies are now looking at um, more local suppliers. And there on cue is my son. Apologies. He's just hit his head, he's told me. Um, <laughs> can you hit your head? It's okay. Um, sorry, he's, he's two minutes early. Um, uh, we are 
I think a lot of our members want to do more and are looking to work together. So I think it's probably without a spoiler alert going to be one of our bigger campaigns as we move into Q3 and Q4 of this year and probably in 2022. The other one you'll be pleased to know is around the perceptions of manufacturing to showcase what we do. Um, and yes, lots of work on the circular economy as well. Our green campaign is probably the biggest one uh, this year because we are doing everything in the run up to COP26. And uh, now he's singing Frozen, let it go. <laughs> um, so we're, do, we're looking at how do we take those, those challenges, turn them into opportunities, and we have a real chance to showcase manufacturing as the solution. And again, this is where I think we have great opportunity, not just with government, but with young people and the, wide, the public to say, we're a digital and green industry. Here we are you know, supporting the transition to, to net zero. This is something that you want to get involved with. So for me, it's just a really exciting time that to be to be talking about our sector. Verity, that was brilliant. Got us out on time. <laughs> you have somewhere else to go and someone else to talk to. Yeah. We really appreciate you yeah. coming and talking to us. I thought you were super. Um, and I thought it, it was really interesting to hear what you had to say. It was great of you to come along. And uh, good luck with the next few minutes of your life because somebody else <laughs> needs you you better let you go um, everybody, if there's any type of job it's this one <laughs> <laughs> listen many many thanks everybody for being with us uh, seven o'clock uh, let's get out of here and uh, see you next week take care bye for now lovely weekend everyone. Thank you,